You can't beat a Wednesday night, guys. And we, we got a little different setup in here tonight. Usually we are having Wednesday night at school. Uh, but tonight, uh, we finished our curriculum last week, and so tonight we're just having a regular service, just a one-spot service. We're going to start Wednesday school back up again January 8th. January 8th, we're going to take a couple weeks off. off. And so um, how many of you guys like Wednesday school? Anybody enjoying Wednesday school out there? Good, good, guys. Good to hear that. Good to see that. Uh, you know, we've been really trying to d- d- dive deep into scriptures and just get closer relationships with people. Church is relationships. Church is not four walls, right? If you don't have relationships in the church, you don't have church. See what I mean? So it's not four walls. We've got to develop relationships. That's the greatest thing. It changed my life when I was able to do that. But, uh, hey, Pastor Brian sends his love tonight. Uh, he's been in the ER uh, the last few nights with his daughter, Briley. And so uh, it's not, it's not a, a terrible situation, but she's, she was just in some major pain and had some stomach issues. And so he sends his love tonight. He wanted to make it in here, but uh, he's helping out Briley tonight. I say we do this. I say we go ahead and pray for our senior pastor Pray for his daughter, Briley, and then we'll get started tonight. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we thank you so much that you are Jehovah Rapha. Lord, you're the, you're the Lord who heals us, Father God. And just as uh, was being spoke about earlier, Father God, how we can look to Jesus, Father God, just as the Israelites looked to the serpent on the rod, Lord, and were healed, we can look to Jesus and be healed. And I just pray that tonight, Briley looks to Jesus on the cross, Lord, and that she's healed right where she's at, Father God, that it's done in Jesus Christ's name. We thank you for it. We praise you for it. Amen. Amen. Amen, guys. Well, cool. Uh, Listen, I'm so excited to speak to you guys tonight. My name is Pastor Jordan Chrysler. I'm the campus pastor here at his church, and uh, I love opportunities to get up on stage and speak to you guys because I'm always digging for fresh water, always digging fresh wells to be able to bring a a good message to you guys. And uh, today, I believe I've got some fire for you. I believe I've got some good words for you, Uh, and it has to do with something no one wants to think about yet. New Year resolutions. You don't want to think about that until after the last Christmas dinner, right? Then you start thinking about New Year's resolutions because New Year's resolutions entail losing something, right? You don't always have to. It can be losing. It can be losing a bad habit. It can be losing an old car. How many of you guys know that most of the time, though, whenever we lose something as a New Year's resolution, we lose weight, right? We're losing weight, right? And I feel that, right? Okay, because since Thanksgiving, I've definitely felt the back fat coming on, okay? I, uh, I lovingly refer to my back fat as uh, back bacon, okay? Just because it, it sounds better because everybody loves bacon, right? You can't not like bacon, so it makes me not hate it as much, right? So uh, I do feel like that's going to go, though, uh, in, in very, very soon because we are having a fast. So you guys know January we're going to have a seven-day fast. Get prepared for that. Prepare on what you're going to do and exactly how you're going to fast unto the Lord. Uh, and we'll, lo- we'll lose the back bacon, okay, church? We will, I promise you. We'll lose a lot of other things that we don't need. But, you know, it's that time of year. It's out with the old, in with the new. Letting some old things die so some new things can start to grow and start to live. Am I right, church? Those things start to have to die away so that new stuff can come on. And I want to read to you a scripture tonight. It comes out of John chapter 20, or I'm sorry, chapter 12, verse 24. It's one of my favorite scriptures on life and death, and I thought it was really cool, Pastor David, how you started speaking on life and death just briefly there, uh, because that's basically what our message is on tonight. It's talking about it's talking about life and death. It's got some of the principles of life and death in it. And so in John chapter 12, verse 24, it says this. It says, most assuredly, uh, let me start over real quick. These words are words in red. This is Jesus' own words, okay, guys? Uh, John chapter 12, verse 24 says, says this. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless... A grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. You know, when I read this scripture, I think about how easy it is to say that you could die for something that you love. You guys think about it sometimes whenever you're thinking about your family, right? I would die for my wife. I would die for my children, right? How much harder is it to say that you will live for something that you will love? And that's kind of the key note scripture I want to talk about today. And the key note point that I want to hit on today is because when we hear about dying for something in this Christian sense, we think about dying for Jesus, right? Okay, that's the ultimate act of death. That is the end of our lives. That's when, when someone we might come to us in the greatest act of persecution and kill us for the gospel, right? That's not necessarily what's happening today because we see in other scriptures... We see in other scriptures how it talks about dying daily, dying daily. It's not something that's a one-time deal, right? 
and I really do believe this. Uh, how many of you guys, this is just a, a, uh, I want to take a, a census really quick. How many of you guys have ever thought of how you would face a, a zombie apocalypse? Anybody in here figure it out? Yeah? How, what kind of weapon you would use? What kind of tools you would use? What kind of bug out bag that you have? What kind of skill that you would take to the table, right, with a team? I'm a fisherman. I would fish. I could maybe yield a knife. I don't know. We'll see, right? So the Christian version of this is basically figuring out what you would do in a terroristic attack, if someone came to you, right, and they said, deny Christ now or you will die. I've thought of this from time to time. I don't know if anybody else has thought of, thought of this scenario. I would love to be able to say in those moments, you know what? I believe in Jesus Christ no matter what. But I can't give you the answer to that right now. That hasn't happened to me, right? It's a very rare thing in America for that to happen. It does happen, but in third world countries and other places around the world, this does happen more often, more, more, more consistently, right? I would want to be the guy that says, yes, I, I'll do anything for Christ. I'll die for Christ right now, but I don't know. And there's not many people I know of that have faced that reality. But if you're one of those people, I would love to meet you. I would love to meet you after service. Please come and shake my hand. I want to meet you. I want to shake your hand. I want to honor you. Um, if you made the right decision, of course, right? If you made the right decision. But uh, it's, it's harder to say that you would live for something you love than to die in one felt swoop, right? Uh, the reason I illustrate this point is because I believe it would be tougher for us to live a life for Christ for 80 or for 90 years rather than to say yes to maybe a terroristic attack, right, in that situation. A tougher to die to yourself daily rather than to have that split-second moment where you're making decisions uh, whether to live or to die. Now, I haven't been in that situation, so I don't know for sure, but a longer life of dying daily seems to be pretty tough. And we're always in this. All of us are in this all the time. It's dying to yourself daily, and we see it in Scripture. Uh, you may be saying, wow, what an uplifting message today. This is great. But I want, to, I want to speak reality to you guys. I want to speak the Scriptures to you guys tonight. And we see in Matthew chapter 10, verse 39, how Scripture tells us to find life, we must lose life. To find our life, we must lose our life. And then again in Luke chapter 9, it tells us we need to deny ourselves daily. This is dying to ourself. This is literally what this means, to die to yourselves. And lots of times, you know, we feed our old identities and we don't realize that for something great to take root in our life and grow, that something old has to die. Something's got to be removed. Something's got to be taken away for something new to grow, right? Our old identities encompass a lot of influences, a lot of different things in our life that make up what our old identities look like. And I would like to list a few of these areas that I believe that we can all afford to lose a little piece of ourself. I'm going to list this to you guys. So if you're taking notes tonight, please write this down. And before we get started, would you just look at your neighbor and say, get rid of the back bacon. Get rid of the back bacon. That's right. You see, Jesus teaches us to deny ourself, and, and one of the ways he does this is in that same area of Scripture that I just referenced from Matthew chapter 10 when he tells us we need to lose our life to find our life. He goes on to continue to say what makes up your life. I believe Jesus is putting together, together a context for us in Matthew chapter 10, uh, starting in verse 36 going through 39, where he talks about the context of what your life actually is made up from. And the first thing I see him say is that, Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. That leads me to my first note, and it's family ties. Everybody just look at your neighbor and say family ties. Family ties. Now, this is heavy, right? This gets really heavy because your family means a lot to you. And this wasn't just a vain statement that Jesus was using for people to love him over their families. No, it was a warning from God Almighty telling us not to hold our family in loyalty and give loyalty to our parents over Jesus Christ. He wants loyalty over even your parents. You know, it's one thing if your parents are running alongside you in the race in the kingdom of God, but it's another thing if your parents are spectating on the sidelines and you're honoring them more by standing on the sidelines with them and spectating as well. You've got to decide, I'm going to honor God more and run the race rather than stand on the sidelines with even your parents. Now, we're supposed to honor our parents, right? That's very important. But when it comes down to this, sometimes you just got to break ties. Sometimes you got to go the different direction. And this goes even further than physical proximity because you can also be loyal to the figment of your parents' imagination. Can you believe it? You can be loyal to the, even just their imagination or what they put in you. The, uh, the, uh, in other words, it's your attitude that they may have grown you up with, right? 
And you might not even be aware of this. You may not even be aware of what's going on in your life, but a voice can come through and you can go, oh, wow, that was my mom. Or, oh, wow, that, that was my dad, right? This is a really tough thing because you feel like whenever you left the nest, you left all that stuff behind, right? No, no, but your spouse is really quick to remind you, you sound like your mama, <laughs> right? Your spouse will be really quick to remind you, you sound a lot like your dad right now, Right? Those are some of the old things that you've just been ingrained and ingrained over years and over years. That stuff is in us. And we've got, we've got to make a decision. We've got to make a decision to cut even the old attitudes, the old thoughts, the old mindsets that even our parents ingrained in us, especially if they weren't of the Lord, right? We've got to make those tie cuts. It's very, very important. You know, the scripture continues to go on in 37, and it says the same thing about your siblings. The same thing is about your brother and your sister. If your brother and sister aren't running the race with you, they're not in Jesus Christ, you've got to move on. You've got to do something else. You've got to let that part of your life die. And that's tough. That's tough sometimes. I think this also extends to your friendships. You're going to have a lot of friendships in your life that, are, that there's loyal ties to those guys, right? There's loyal ties. I think loyalty is one of my favorite characteristics of a person. I have many favorite characteristics in a person of people, but loyalty is one of my number one favorite characteristics. When I see it in a person, I honor that person for loyalty. Whether it's loyalty to the wrong thing or to the right thing, if they're loyal, I like loyalty, right? I love loyalty in a person. I especially love loyalty when it's towards, towards me, right? If we have any friends in the room, right? You love when your friends are loyal to you, right? We all love a loyal friend. We enjoy a loyal friend. Loyal friend. I had a, a set of loyal friends growing up. These were my ride or dies. These were my homies, okay? These guys would do anything for me, and I would say it even then. I would take a bullet for these guys, right? At the time, I, probably, I, I think I may have even done that, right? These were my closest, closest friends, and they were loyal to me, and I was loyal to them. But I especially prize loyal in some, loyalty in someone whenever they're loyal to God above anything else. That is an especial, a special prize of loyalty for someone. But, you know, whenever I was with my buddies, I had, I had to make a decision whether to let that thing live or to let that thing die so that something else could grow. I had to decide, let those friendships die off. And so I had to make a decision to stop calling. I literally stopped calling friends that were in my old life. Didn't even pick up the phone to call them again. A few years down the road, I'd hear from some of them. I had a meeting with one of them about five years down the road, and he, he, was, he was still offended at what I had done. Didn't have a clue, didn't understand. Well, I may have done it the wrong way, but if I hadn't done something, I would still be in the state I was in. I'd still be stuck in that friendship situation, and I'd still be doing the same exact thing that they're doing right now, which was the same thing they were doing 15 years ago, the same exact thing. So I'm grateful for, the, for that break in those ties, the letting, that, the letting of that thing just, just die right in front of me. I had to choose to let that part of my identity, that part of my life perish and die that day. The next one is, so we had the first one, which was family ties. If you're taking notes, write down family ties. The next one was your friendship ties. And the scripture references for those is Matthew, Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. The scriptures, uh, the next one I'm going to pull up is livelihood ties livelihood ties. Now this can actually kind of be controversial, but let me explain it all to you before you make any judgments upon me, okay? Livelihood ties. You know, I counsel people from time to time and they know for, without a shadow of a doubt that their livelihood, their livelihood choice is actually dictating the health of their marriage and their family, right? This is tough because as men, we, we, we put a big premium on being able to bring in bacon. There's that word again, bacon into the house, right? We want to be able to bring in our, the money into the house to provide for our family, right? But I have people come to me from time to time and they say, hey, uh, Pastor Jordan, we've got these issues, these issues, and, and I find out some things about their lives so I can kind of take a diagnosis on the spiritual situation, find out they're working 17, 16 hours a day, seven days, six days a week, right? Right? It's tough, right? It's a tough living, and it's, it's even harder to have a healthy family life. There's scripture that comes out of Matthew chapter 19, verse 29. It says this, Everybody who's left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands, and other translations can say fields, right? How did they make their livelihood in the past? In fields, right? So whenever they leave their lands for their name's sake, he says this, they shall, a hundred, they shall receive a hundredfold, and inherit eternal life. I tell you right now, if you know you're in this situation uh, of livelihood and you know, man, I don't know whether I should continue in this job or not because it's taken away from family, it's taken away from my wife. You have zero, literally zero family time, zero wife time, zero husband time throughout the week. God will reward you on the other side of a good decision. 
He'll give you, it says here, it says he'll give you 100-fold. He'll also give you eternal life, right? So we have to make a decision, even if our livelihood could come in the way, right? We have to let some of that stuff die, okay? Now, this isn't pastor said, I could quit, honey. I don't like my boss, right? Let's not make that decision. I'm not giving you the out on quitting your job just because you don't like your boss. Because the Bible says this, if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. You don't work, you shouldn't eat, okay? We all have to work. We don't all have to work at the bikini bar, okay? It's just, it's important, all right? You don't have to work there. You don't have to work anywhere that you, that feels like it's going to come against your spirituality. It's going to come against you. Now, now if, so, if you got a little, a little spat at your work with somebody who's not a Christian, that's not a reason to quit your job, right? I feel like the folks in the room that this is applying to, God's already been working on your heart for this. And I feel like that if you honor God and even this, even something as strong and is primal and as something as needed as livelihood, that God will also open up an opportunity for you. It's right on the other side of saying, God, I want you to help make me better. Job opportunity will open up. Just watch. Just wait. Just see. I just feel by the Spirit of God somebody's in here in that situation right now. And you've, you've got, uh, you got maybe too many hours or, or, or it's a situation like that. But I feel like God's going to open a door for you when you decide to step that direction. And it's just a step in that direction. Doesn't, I mean, you don't have to go running, but just step in that direction. Ask God for help. Ask God to reveal these things to you. And he's going to open a door up of opportunity for you. A door that's going to uh, allow for you to, for, to have more family time, to have more time with your, with your spouse, to have more time to build a healthy marriage, a healthy relationship with your kids, a healthy relationship, uh, uh, just more time to do what God's called you to do. God's going to open this door for you. I believe it uh, in Jesus' mighty name. I don't know who, that, who that's for, but I believe that, that word's for somebody out here today in Jesus' name. The next one, we've talked about uh, family ties. We've talked about friendship ties. We've talked about livelihood ties even. The next one's attitude. I don't have much to say on this one other than this point. There are certain ways of thinking that God wants you to sacrifice on the altar. And he's going to come back and he's going to restore your mindset. He's going to change your mindset. But you've got to make a decision to let that thing die. You've got to put it on the altar and you got to kill it. The next one is this, religion. Even religion, church. See, God is a manifold God. He's a manifold God. All right, and that, that, that word in the Hebrew uh, means rabah, rabha. It's a hard one to say. Rabha, which means many or abundant. Uh, it means to multiply. It suggests a variety or a diverseness. You see, he's without discrimination when it comes to the way he speaks and he ministers to the children of God through Christ Jesus, right? Got to make sure you say that, right? Because he's not as diverse as a universalism, right? No, he's the kind of God that speaks any way that God chooses to speak, but it's always going to be through Christ Jesus, right, church? All right, so I want you to know that tonight because when we look at that, we can think of a, a couple of different stories um, there's one about a, a, a guy named uh, Balaam, okay? And this was a magician uh, out of the Old Testament. And God actually chose to speak to this magician through a donkey, right? He can speak through many, many different ways. And there's many different uh, movements going on in the United States right now. Right now, that would seem completely out of whack, would see, seem completely crazy. But God actually is ministering to people in those situations in those different, different areas. I'm not quick to judge those situations because I know God spoke to me in many different ways at many different times. And I'm grateful for his manifold, his manifold presence and his manifold, his manifold speaking when he speaks to us in those different ways. But uh, Balaam, he, he, had, he had a donkey, and he was paid an amount of money to go and to curse, to send curses upon the people of Israel. And uh, he, he was known for curses. He was known for, uh, if he gave blessings to people, how they would be blessed. He was a magician, right? So this foreign king sent him to go to a place to curse Israel. And he's on his donkey traveling this direction. The donkey sees the trouble ahead, but he didn't. There was, a, there was an angel of God standing with a sword there. And if he came any closer to him, he was going to cut him down, right? The donkey decided to stop. And he just continued to go ahead and beat the donkey and drive the donkey until the donkey crushed his leg up against the side of the wall. He got off the donkey. The donkey spoke to him and said, why are you beating me? Why are you beating me? He continued to beat him a little bit. And then he finally realized that this donkey was trying to help him. This donkey saved his life because the angel of the Lord said, if you had to come any closer, I'd have chopped you down with my sword. You see, this man beat this way. He beat this way. He beat this thing, right? And I think sometimes we push the way that we may have done church in the past to the point past God and past where he would allow it. We feel like sometimes this is the only way to access the Lord. This is the only way we can do it. But we have to be willing even to let that fade away. 
Some of those things that we let fade away that we call, that we call sacred, that aren't actually things that God, God calls sacred. He doesn't call those things sacred. Maybe it's, maybe it's a change in leadership. Maybe it's a change in leadership, and you think, man, I, I don't know if I can go to God this way anymore. Maybe it's as simple as the volume on the soundboard, right? It's, it's gone up a little bit, right? Maybe it's as simple as where the placement of the tithe and offering envelopes are at. Well, I want you to know today, church, if God is in it, it doesn't matter where the envelopes go. If God is there, it doesn't matter the level of the worship. It do, if God is there, nothing else matters. And he'll greet you right where he's at. We've got to be ready to put to death even things that we find religious in our life, even things that we think that we, think we have to have to go to God. We've got to really ask God, hey, God, what do I need to come to you? What do I need to come to you? And a lot of the things you don't need to pass away so something new can grow. What happens, <clears throat> what happens when we're not willing to let these things die for the comfort of a few? We start to begin to be unknowingly discrimination to have unknowing discrimination against other people, right? We don't even know that we're doing it. It's the fear of discrimination towards the closer group that's around us that actually causes us to dis- dis- discriminate against a group of people that have yet to come, right? Because if you can't grow because you, you're going to God a certain way and it's keeping people from your doors, right, you start to discriminate against everybody that's outside the doors. It's a flip discrimination. So you're discriminating either way against either the people that are in the building or the people that are out the building, Right? But God wants us to cut things out of our life and let those things die so we can make room for many, many more. He wants that. He wants people to come into the house of God. All of these different things, they start to combine to equal our personal desires. They all make up our personal desires. And oftentimes those personal desires are contrary to what God's calling us to do. Our desires aren't aren't always opposite of God. But here's the thing. His ways are so much higher than ours. They're so much higher than ours. And so we have to be listening and ready to put to death anything that gets in the way. Take into consideration Father Abraham. You see, uh, Abraham's faith was confirmed, and the account is in Genesis chapter 22. And I want to read it to you guys today. It says this. This is a long passage, so be ready. It says this. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to Abraham, and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, now take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Morah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. He split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to a place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham, Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, look, the fire, the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place where God had told him, and Abraham built an altar. He built the altar and placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him upon the altar, upon the wood. And Adam stretched out his hand, or Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, don't lay a hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Wow. Let me just change course for just one second, okay, guys? I want you guys to see exactly what's going on here, okay? Because our God is so manifold. Our God, our God is so thoughtful. Our God is so wise and wonderful that what he did in this scripture in Genesis is that he shows us a blueprint for him and his son, Jesus Christ. He shows us exactly what it's going to look like thousands of years down the road whenever Jesus Christ is being sacrificed. This is an echo. And let me help you unpack this really quick. Abraham was to sacrifice his son whom he loved. 
on a mountain which God would tell him. In verse 2 it says that that mountain was also possibly the mountain that Jesus Christ walked up to be crucified on. The, the, the place of the skull or Golgotha. You've heard of that, right? That's speculated to be the same exact hill that, that Isaac walked up to take the sacrifice. All right, in verse 4, Abraham went, to the th- uh, went on the third day to this place. He had the knowledge from God for three whole days that his son was to be slain. Jesus Christ laid in the tomb for three whole days. And in verse 5, he states, we will come back to you. God told him to sacrifice his son. Why would he assume that both he and his son were going to return to them after this whole thing was over? Well, Abraham had a very intimate relationship with God. He had a very intimate relationship with God, so much so that he knew something that no one else knew. In verse 6, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And Isaac walked up, what did we say earlier? That very same hill that Jesus Christ walked up with the wood of the cross on his back. We see a beautiful correlation that God worked out before time, before, he probably worked this out before time even began. He had it all figured out that the blueprint of Abraham and his son Isaac, who was the very seed of the promise, was going to give birth to Jesus Christ later on down the road. That's how manifold our God is. That is how wise our God is. That is how wonderful our God is, church, that he could put things like that together way, way in advance. I'm sure there's lots of other things like that we don't even know about yet. He is so thoughtful. But Abraham's boy was the son of the promise, church. He was the son of the promise. How was this man supposed to die? How was this boy supposed to pass away if he was going to be the son of the promise, the very promise that Jesus Christ was going to come from, right? He was supposed to be born from that. It wasn't just any little promise. It wasn't, it wasn't a pinky promise, okay? This was a promise in blood. It was a blood covenant that both Abraham and the Lord passed through and that God himself swore unto himself because he could swore to no one higher than himself. It was a promise that Abram actually held onto and because of it became Abraham. He got a name changed out of the deal, right? God made a promise with Abraham and now the desire of his heart his very own son. Psalms chapter 37 says, if you seek the Lord, you're, you're all, almighty with all your heart, with all your mind, everything that you got, that he'll give you the desires of your heart. Well, he'd done that. And now the desire of his heart was to be threatened, to be killed. We didn't, we didn't see exactly what happened next, but I want to read, you, read that to you real quick. I want you to know this. No, I got news for you, church. We haven't found everything, guys. We haven't found everything that we, we could potentially lose. We don't even know that yet. But there's, there's sometimes there's more stuff to be lost. And there's more stuff to be found. We have to have an open heart and open mind ready for things to be able to die in our life so that new things can live. Abraham didn't know what was going to happen. He had no clue what was going to happen. But he decided to trust God anyway and allow something that he held so dear to die. You might have something that you hold so dear in your life some kind of attitude, some type of thought process, some type of livelihood, some type of family connection, some type of friendship connection that you hold so dear in your life and you don't want to let it go, but God says, sacrifice it unto me, and if you do, I'll make room for so much more. I want you to see what happened with Abraham whenever he decided to do this. Whenever we see Abraham do this, we see life and we see a multiplication of life. Think about the multiplication of Abraham and how he's willing to let that seed die. We can read it down in verse 15 in the same passage. It says this, Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing, and you have not withheld your son from me, your only son. Blessings, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens and as the sand on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemy and your seed. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned his young men, returned to his young men and they rose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt in Beersheba. I love, love that passage of scripture. I love hearing this. I love reading about this uh, because it just shows you, man, even if God gave him the desires of his heart and this was the very seed of the promise, he still was able to say, I'm going to let this go. There's nothing in our lives that we hold as dear as that promise that Abraham held. He was given it to it by the king of the universe. Blood covenant poured it out and he was still able to say, I'm going to let this go. And because he said, I was going to let this go, life sprang forward. 
I mean, he literally was, the, he was Father Abraham. He had many sons, right? He had many sons because of the obedience of what he did and how he decided to follow God. They were more than the sand of the seashore. They were more than the stars of the sky. Church, tonight I want to ask you this. What are you holding on to? What do you have in your hand that you're not willing to let die that God's asking you to give up? What is there? What do you have on life support? Some of us are holding on so tightly to something that has already been dying that we just need to continue to let go and let that thing die so that God can come back on the other side and breathe life into you and get something going in your life. And we'll look at verse 19 one more time. In the story, we see a beautiful word. I want to read it again. It comes out of verse 19 uh, in that scripture. And it says this. Well, if I can find it here, praise God. Verse 19. Here we go. Here we go. Praise Jesus. It says, so Abraham returned to his young men and they rose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. The word I want to focus on is rose. It's a beautiful word, not just in the physical sense because it's one of the most lusted after flowers that you could ever want. It's a rose. But it's even a beautiful word in action. Isaac rose from the altar. Isaac and his father rose from that place with the two other men and went to Beersheba. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. You see what's happening here? You see that, that something great had to die for something great to go on. Something wonderful had to pass away for life to spring forward. And through that promise that God made to Abraham, we had life abundant. And now we're all, we're all sons of Father Abraham, right? And through the death that Jesus had to pay, through that death that he had to take, we've all rose into life now because of Jesus dying for us. There's something in every single one of our lives that we must allow to pass away. We must allow to die so we can see new life so that we can see new growth. I want to do this for you now, church. I want you just to bow your heads and close your eyes. If you're in here under the sound of my voice and you say, man, I've got something that I haven't let go of that I need to allow to die. Sometimes it's easier just to let these things die. Sometimes you actually have to kill it. Sometimes it's tougher. Maybe you need to ask God for the help to kill it. I'm sure Abraham had to ask the Lord for strength to kill his own son. There's something. I want you just to bow your heads, close your eyes, and I want you right now just to visualize what that thing is. Whatever that thing is, man, just decide to say today, I'm going to let it die or I'm going to kill it. God wants to do something great in your life. God wants you to live. God wants to not just bless you, but he wants to multiply you. Multiplying, multiply. Blessing, bless. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you receive this vision right now. I pray right now he gives, you the, he gives you the mode of operation. He gives you the confidence. He gives you the boldness. He gives you the wisdom. He gives you everything that you need to kill this thing, everything that you need to allow this thing to die, to see new growth. Just like your word says, Father God, John chapter 12, verse 24. Unless that grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. I pray in the name of Jesus, you help everybody under the sound of my voice. Bless them, Father God, today. Bless them with whatever they need, Lord, to allow this to come to pass. In Jesus, mighty, mighty name. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand clap, church. Praise God. Praise God. Well, listen, guys, I'm, I was so excited to be able to uh, speak to you tonight. Uh, it was an honor. It was an honor. But uh, uh, we've got a few things coming up. I just want to remind you guys before we dismiss tonight uh, that we have our Christmas service coming up. It is this Sunday. All three services are uh, His church. Uh, Christmas at His church is our traditional Christmas service. And then following that on uh, Tuesday night, uh, that is Christmas Eve, I believe, Tuesday night at 9 o'clock. We're having a Christmas Eve service. You don't want to miss this. Uh, we haven't done one in a while here, but we want you to come in to do a Christmas Eve service with us. Bring your kids. If you got kiddos, bring them in their pajamas. Uh, we're going to have them come up on stage. We're going to read the Christmas story to them. We'll have hot chocolate down there. It's going to be a great time. But do me a favor. Take the cards that are in the seats there beside you guys. And I, I, I dare you. I challenge you. Invite somebody to the house of God this week that you don't know. Just put a, put a, put a card in their hand. Just say, hey, 
I invite you. Be my guest. I invite you. So listen, guys, we're so glad you're here. If you're a first-time guest, we would love to meet you guys over here at our first-time area. We have our worship team, our amazing worship team. Give them a hand clap, guys. They did a great job tonight. We got husband and wife team up here tonight. That's awesome, guys. Praise God. I love it. I love it. Well, guys, listen, that's all we have for you tonight. We love you. God bless you. We'll see you soon.